A couple of years ago, I flew home to visit family. I'd be there about a week, then we'd head to the coast for a week, then back home for another week. I totally needed this break. I'd just end in an on-again, off-again relationship. Like, seriously. One day on, the next day off. It took seven months of putting up with it, because you're supposed to fight for what is important to you, right? Anyhow, I finally just said it was done. No more chances. No trying to work it out. Just done. So, with that chapter of my life being over, I was more than happy to be somewhere else, surrounded by family, and begin putting myself back together. Got there, spent a couple of days sleeping a lot. My mother's a nurse and she was becoming concerned that there was something physically wrong with me. I just needed a couple days in a safe place where I could let my brain work on digesting the new life I would have when I got back home. So, before we left for the coast, I met up with a friend from grade school that I kept in contact with over the years. I thought it would just be he and I, but it didn't really faze me that another person was there. We hung out for a while and then I needed to head back home, because I had to take a backwoods rural route to get home, or take a different route that would add another 20 miles onto my trek. Being backwoods, I needed to be able to keep an eye out for deer, so I said goodbye and told S.A. that if he was ever in my neck of the woods, look me up and we'd grab a drink and hang out. I told him to grab my number from my friend and out the door I went. About halfway home, I got this weird queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach, so I slowed way down and sure enough, there was a deer in the middle of the road. Because I had slowed down, I could see another car out on the road. I couldn't shake the queasy feeling, so I figured it would be better to cut off and go down the main road because there were more places to stop. I seriously didn't want to stop in some rural farmer's driveway. I've watched too many movies to make that mistake. So, I get over to the main road and pull into a gas station and sit there for a couple of minutes, trying not to get sick to my stomach. I ran into the store, grabbed some water and ginger ale, and came back out to my vehicle, still unable to shake that queasy feeling. So, I started to head home from the gas station and knew I didn't want to go straight home. So, I drove around, taking this road or that road, until that weird feeling started to go away. Then I went home, read for a bit, and then went to sleep. Next day, everything was fine and we headed off to the coast. Fast forward two weeks. The trip is over. I'm still feeling a bit fragile over the breakup, but that's all. I figured I would begin the process of cleansing the environment of negative energies and then the work through the baggage that came from the breakup. I knew there was a lot and it would take time. So the next day, I'm going about my business and everything is cool as can be when picking through the junk left behind after a breakup. I'm really just doing mindless things to zone out and not have to think too much on the activity since my brain was working full time already. A little bit later in the day, my phone rings. I don't get a lot of phone calls, so I assume there might be a family emergency and that I needed to answer it ASAP. The area code of the caller, who is not in my contacts, is the same as my cousin, so I answered without a second thought. On the other end was SA, the acquaintance I met at my friend's house. It's a little weird to have him be calling me, but I'm not thinking that anything is terribly out of the ordinary. I asked him what was up and he said he was at the airport. I still find it a little odd, but I said, oh, that's cool. Where are you going? He said that he'd already landed. Again, I'm distracted and really just want to get him off the phone so I could get back to my mental sidestep and zone out while my brain chugged away. So I said that he hoped he had a good time wherever he was, and he said that he needed me to pick him up. <laughs> what? Did you just say you needed me to pick you up? Yeah, he replied. I came to visit you. I paused there for a sec. I know for a fact that I didn't show any more interest in him than general courtesy. Even the tossed over the shoulder look me up comment was one of those polite things to say because you never actually plan on seeing them again. Unpause. Why did you come to visit me? I asked. He said he felt a deep connection and wanted to be with me. I'm starting to get angry as well as freaked out at this stage. I told him I didn't feel a connection at all and couldn't believe that he would fly across country to see someone that he'd spent maybe two hours with. He said that I invited him when I said to look him up. I said, um, no, that's just the polite thing to say to some random person that has made a very small impression on me. He said that he needed to find a way back home since I misled him. Misled him? WTF? Look me up if you're ever in my neck of the woods had led him to think that was a basis for any sort of encounter that was meaningful? He said that he needed a place to stay until he could get money for a plane ticket back. I said there were more than enough hotels that he could stay at while he got himself sorted out. He said he didn't have any money after buying the random one-way plane ticket. 
So, at this stage, I'm flabbergasted, angry, and freaked out that someone would do that on a one-way ticket. I finally caved in and said he could stay the night while he sorted things out, but I expected him to be gone no later than the morning of the day after tomorrow. So, I bring him back to my place, throw pillows and a blanket on the couch, and turn to head to my bedroom, and he asks if he can sleep with me. I'm like, uh, no. Actually, no f***ing way is that going to happen. So I point out that I have firearms and him to not attempt to come in. Next day I have to work, so I woke him up and told him to get up and find a way home immediately. I also told him that I had to work but would check in on his progress because the next morning I was dropping him off at departures regardless of whether he had a way back or not. Went to work and he blew up my phone all day. Wanted me to come back to my place for lunch. Told him, no way. I'm way too busy. I finally get home from work and I'm chuckling at a text that I got about my dog. And that's when I noticed that he rearranged everything. And by everything, I mean every room in the house has been rearranged. I flipped my lid. I asked him why he thought it was normal to do anything that he did. Instead of answering, he asked me who I'd been talking to. I said that it really wasn't any of his business, but I had received a text from the guy watching my dog while I was on vacation. Color me shocked when he says he doesn't want me to talk to that guy. No longer freaked. Full force apocalyptic disaster is about to be unleashed and leave nothing but a smoking crater. The temperature drops about 10 degrees and I very calmly said to get his things and I was calling a cab to take him to the airport because he's a freaking psycho. Side note. Full rage has been achieved when it feels like the temperature drops and I speak very calmly. If I'm complaining about something, it's a quick burn. If I go monotone calm and tilt my head to one thing slightly, that is where I hit arctic level anger. So, he, unaware of the environmental change that has occurred and that the chances of survival are dropping by the second, decides to tell me that he used my computer and got my ex's phone number and they both agree that I was just heartless. We're fast approaching the epic scale disaster and he finally seems to notice how deep into rage I had sunk. I told him it was unlikely that he had gotten into my computer because it's a full quote of a part of the Art of War by Sun Tzu and that he would have to have been the processing power of the Hadron Collider computers, and it was obvious that was not the case. I told him he had three minutes to get his stuff and get out, or I wouldn't be responsible for what would occur. So, still yelling insults at me, he gathers his stuff and leaves. I used to get calls and texts from him, I'd block one and six more would pop up, but it eventually stopped. To this day, I have no idea nor interest in knowing where he's at or if he made it back. So. Crazy dude who would hop on a plane with a one-day ticket based on a random polite comment? Let's not meet. Again. Whoa. That is severely messed up. You should have called the police on this man the moment he said, Yeah, I'm here. Uh, can you pick me up? Oh, also, can I sleep in your bed with you? And then whenever he's claiming that he went through your computer, that's stalkerish behavior. And that generally doesn't stop. You've become the object of his desire and he won't stop. So stay safe, OP. Long time lurker and first time poster. Helpful and pertinent background information. This happened over seven years ago, spring of 2013, in Barcelona, Spain. Barcelona is a large city made up of many districts. This took place in the Example District, where I lived at the time. This is my best attempt to describe the makeup of the example district. Like most big cities, there are blocks. Block after block. The area begins to develop into a grid-like pattern. However, example is unique because each block is shaped like an octagon. So when you are picturing this area of the city, think of it as an entire chunk of octagons. I was told that the octagon pattern, rather than true squares, make it easier for drivers to see perpendicular traffic slash street when approaching an intersection. Lastly, some folks use the edge or corners of this octagon grid pattern to park their vehicle when quickly running into a cafe or pharmacy. If I have sufficiently confused you with my poor written description, may I remind you that Google is your friend. At the time of this incident, I was a 27-year-old blonde white female studying abroad from the United States and Barcelona, Spain. Spanish was my minor in college, so I was fairly confident in my abilities to navigate the city and interact with the locals. Ashley was also a 20-year-old blonde white female studying abroad from the United States. On to the story. It is a Friday or Saturday night in March. A large group of us, both women and men, decide to go out and have a good time. 
We always find ourselves at big bustling nightclubs, dancing the night away. The night itself is unremarkable. Although I cannot remember exactly what time we all decided to head back to our residence, I know it's very late slash into the early hours of the morning. The men's cab comes first and they each pile into and head home. As the girls are waiting for our multiple cabs, a girl in our group, Ashley, decides that she will not wait any longer and will walk home. Don't forget, this is after a night out drinking and dancing and definitely a drunken Ashley decision. We all try to convince Ashley to wait for the cabs and ride home with us. However, she is hell bent on walking home. Because it is cold and late, all the other girls in the group decide to let Ashley go on and continue to wait for their cabs. I, on the other hand, cannot let Ashley walk home by herself. We are in a foreign city. It is past two in the morning. It is a chilly evening slash morning in March. We are wearing scandy clothing with big heels. We are drunk. And this is before iPhones had affordable long-term international plans, AKA, we have no cell phones. I yell to Ashley, who has already begun her trek home to wait up. It is important to note that this is no brisk walk up the street. Our residence is 2.4 kilometers, approximately one and a half miles from our starting point. I catch up with Ashley to begin the trek home. A few blocks away from the nightclub, the city is relatively quiet. Ashley and I are huddling together on our walk to stay warm while laughing and joking about the night's events when we notice a dark green sedan pulling into a parking spot located on one of the corners slash edges of the block directly in front of us. As this is happening, Ashley and I decide to cross the street to avoid walking past this vehicle. The dark green sedan is still running and the headlights are still on. As we are crossing the street, a slender man, probably around 5 foot 7 ish, stepped halfway out of the driver's side door of the vehicle asks, what is the time in Spanish? Although thinking this is odd because surely his vehicle has a clock, I replied, late, in Spanish. I believe the man follows up with an additional question or statement, but I cannot remember the nature. I do know that we did not respond. Ashley and I do not think much of this encounter and continue our trek home. After progressing a couple of more blocks, we say this same dark green sedan slowly passing in front of us. However, after a long night of drinking, we question whether it is really the same car from a couple of minutes prior. We end up convincing ourselves that we are being paranoid and continue to walk home, albeit at a quicker pace. As we are laughing at how ridiculous we are, the dark green sedan passes in front of us yet again, but this time going in the other direction. It is as if he is continuously crossing our paths horizontally by turning left or right after each block. After two or three times, Ashley and I know, one, we are not just paranoid, and two, that this car is taking active measures to follow us. Ashley and I quickly sobered up and began speed walking fast as possible, repetitively crossing the street in an effort to lose the man in the dark green sedan. Understand that we believed we could not change course as we only knew this one particular way home, and we did not have access to a map via cell phones. We are presumably only halfway to our residence at this point. Ashley and I are quietly discussing what our next move will be when we see that the dark green sedan has again parked in a parking spot along the edges slash corners of the next block. However, this time his headlights are turned off. As soon as we spot the vehicle, Ashley and I quickly take cover behind a larger vehicle that is parked on the side of the street. Terrified, we are as still as statues. Neither of us mutters a word. I cannot tell you how long we hunched behind this truck, but it felt like forever. After looking underneath this truck, we see that the dark green sedan is gone. We both sigh a huge sigh of relief, thinking we have lost him. We cross to the other side of the street and continue our way towards the residence. Despite our wishes, Ashley and I's encounter with the man in the dark green sedan is far from over. We are alert as ever, asking ourselves how much farther until we reach our destination, continuously looking back over our shoulder. We see the man from the dark green sedan following us. However, this time, he is on foot, walking directly two or three blocks behind us. Ashley and I scream and take off running as fast as we can, like we have throughout our walk home. We cross the street to place more distance between ourselves and the man from the dark green sedan. As we are running for our lives, Ashley and I remove our heels so we can run even faster. It is on this evening that I learned that heels serve a dual purpose weapons. We hold our shoes in our hands facing heel out, just in case we need to defend ourselves. I glance behind us. No man from the dark green sedan. 
I glance across the street. No man from the dark green sedan. We continued running, gasping for air. Ashley and I running stride and stride with one another. Neither one of us sees the man from the dark green sedan anymore. We are confused. Where did he go? What does he want? Why is he following us? Though we do not stop sprinting home, we slow down a notch to catch our breath. With each leap, Ashley and I are looking in every direction surrounding us. Ashley then sternly says, Across the street! Across the street! I look directly across the street, and there he is. I see the man from the dark green sedan running alongside of us. He is neck and neck with our every leap. There is only the street and a line of parked vehicles on either side of the same street separating us from this crazy man. Each time I look, he is ducking in and out of the parked vehicles on the side of the street, attempting to avoid our detection. At this point, Ashley and I are on the verge of tears. We are running like never before, and this madman has been following us for what feels like a lifetime. Just when it feels there is no end in sight, I begin to notice our surroundings. We are close to our residence. Only residents can access the residence with a magnetic key card. I fumble as I run barefoot on the Barcelona streets for my entrance key. I find it in the nick of time. As I place the key card on the reader, Ashley is yelling at me. He's coming! He's coming! Hurry! Hurry! The door finally opens. Once in our building, we pour the door shut so the automatic lock will activate. When I hear the door lock into place, my legs suddenly feel like jello and I can barely make it up the few stairs to the lobby. Crying, Ashley and I tell the man stationed at the front desk, who we appropriately name Baldy, to call Spain's equivalent to 911. Baldy looks at us with a blank stare and asks, why? We explain to him what just happened and that the man from the dark green sedan is right around the corner. Baldy laughed at us and told us to stop telling him drunk stories and go to our rooms. It has been over seven years since this happened, and I still think of it far too often. Though Ashley and I are back in the United States, we live hundreds of miles apart. When we do catch up, we always briefly acknowledge our close encounter and thank God we made it out the way we did. I have no idea what the man from the dark green sedan's intention were, but there is no doubt in my mind that they were not good. So, to the man in the dark green sedan, let's not meet. OP, I am really glad that you got out of that situation because too many people don't. Either they accept a ride from somebody like that, or they just get snatched and you never see them again. So I am glad that you got out of there. But with that being said, I'm going to leave this episode of Let's Not Meet here. I hope you like the stories, and if you did, I'm going to link in the description as always. And if you like the video, subscribe, share, drop a like, and a comment down below with what you'd like to see me read next. A humongous thank you to everyone who keeps subscribing. I cannot thank you for what y'all do, and I know my upload schedule has been a bit honky lately, but I'm working to fix that. So. Thank you for what you do. But with that being said, I will see you in the next video.